Well, it's great to have you on the Global Kingdom Conversation this week. Um, as normal, we uh, are welcoming also our invisible audience that hears us through the YouTube channel. It's good to have you all joining us as well, just to let you know that you may be out of sight, but you're not out of mind. As you can see on the screen, we have our building uh, the society that Jesus had in mind. This is the nation builders. Um, we're having the uh, our nation builders summit coming up on June 23rd. 24th, 2023. Now that time is going to be 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. British Standard Time, Saturday, June 24th, 2023. And as you can see on the, um, the information there, www.nationbuilders.vision is how you sign up for it. And so this will be focusing on the theme of building the society Jesus had in mind. The Nation Builders Summit of 2023 is a first of its kind event gathering kingdom-minded citizens passionate about expanding the kingdom through the ecclesia in their regions. So this summit brings together merging thought leaders and citizens from across the globe who are at the cutting edge of developing nationhood within the body of Christ. I also have a couple of more slides here. Uh, I'd like to show you these are the panelists that will be of course, uh, Fred Tobin out of the UK and Palumi uh, out of the UK will out there will be hosting Well, they'll be hosting the um, the event. Then we have David Castro, our very own David Castro and Ivan Gonzalez, of course, Anderson Williams, Tim Kurtz and Charles Opeo, along with myself, we will be panelists for this event. And let's see. Here's like an overview of what will uh, what will take place uh, during that time. This can kind of give you a, a context of what will be uh, what will be taking place. So there'll be the welcome from nine to nine ten and so forth, and then nine fifteen to ten, setting the context, nation builders building the society that Jesus had in mind, and then uh, session two, ten fifteen to twelve thirty, and so on like that. Just a little breakdown of that. And these are our panelists in a different form there. So just want you to get excited about this, this uh, summit that will be coming up on June 24th of this year, just a few weeks. And uh, be sure you register at www.nationbuilders.vision. All right. So as we start today, as we start today, I want to open up for just any any type of comments or any thoughts since uh, Andy's presentation on sonship. Uh, we we've been dealing with this for for several several weeks on the times that he's presented it, and so I'd like to hear from you and what has been the impressions that has come upon your heart and mind as this has been presented. And we know that God does not allow these kind of words to come out aimlessly that they have a place and God is trying to get our attention and really get us to see something uh, uh, during this time. And so one of the things that I, I have been challenged with, with, with sonship and challenge seeing is the fact of balancing what I see and what God and who God has called me to be. So there is a reminder for myself to go back to scripture, go back to what God said, and to really solidify those truths inside of my heart. Because many times, you know, what we're looking at and what we're dealing with uh, is a challenge from day to day. So uh, this idea of sonship really elevates the thinking and gets us on God's page and what his original intent was for sonship and how we're to walk and how we're to carry this inside of the earth as sons and, and to really reflect and display a different type of humanity in the earth. If, I, if I'm capturing what, what Andy has presented um, uh, to us. So that's my take. If you have any thoughts on or any impact that has happened to you regarding this idea of sonship and what it means to you and how it's impacted your life to even live forward from today on, Mike is open uh, before we get started into bringing Andy on. Anyone, raise your hand. We can 
we can hear from you. The idea of sonship and those things that have been presented so far. Okay, Lincoln. Lincoln from Trinidad, good to have you on. Lincoln, you're on mute. All right, right, right. Okay, I just I just unmuted. Thank you. Uh, good all afternoon. All. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that struck me in, in, in this presentation was that we 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 tend to live in a, a kind of false humility um, before God. And when you think of a son going to his to his parents' house, he walks in there with with with, with an air of just not just authority, but with confidence and having that assurance that he's accepted and that he is um, valued as, as, as their son. And I think the enemy has done one on us, making us believe that, yeah, it's by grace we have, been, we, 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 have, we, have a, we have achieved this status. But the thing is here that we are not to cower um, down before um, our father, but he wants us to, to greet him as as we probably greet our earthly dads and to really embrace him and to know that we are carrying his grace in us and, he, and his authority in us that we can walk around and, and deal with the enemy wherever we see him and not feel that we, are, we don't have the anointing to do it or we are not called to do it because we are called to do it. That's what Jesus did on the earth when he came. He dealt with the enemy wherever he saw him and see what uh, things he was doing to, to God's uh, people. So I, I want to say that it has changed my perspective and is changing my perspective as I go on. Um, I have to still review the, the, the recordings, uh, but I, I still take that from it that instead of walking around in a sort of a false humility, I must walk around now with the full knowledge that I am a son of, a son of God. And I therefore have many um, privileges. And I also have the authority of Jesus that I can use against the enemy and in various situations that confront me. Thank you so much. Well, Linda, Good morning. Uh, Lincoln, before you go, uh, and Levita, before mm -hmm. before you come on, I wanted to ask. I wanted to follow up with Lincoln on on that. This false humility, Lincoln. Where where do you think that comes from? Does it come from a, the complex of the individual upbringing, religion? What what do you think that comes from? And can you describe what you mean by false humility? Okay, it's 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 like um, I think part of it is is all bringing, and another part is the enemy is um, denying us the. The, 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 well, I, I used to work in our minds to think that I'm a sinner saved by grace. But that, that, that is like I just got into the kingdom. I, I don't have any, I can't walk around as I, as I want to. I, I have to be careful of every step I take. I don't want to offend the father. And I have to be so careful um, of not being um, ungrateful. So it, it, it brings us to a point where we are almost afraid to do anything in Jesus' name, lest we offend the Father. But we have to know that we are a son. We are a son. And therefore, th th those things that, we, that, that come to our hearts when we see um, situations around us or the things that confront us, that we, are, um, we have the privilege of using his authority and, and you know, could be guided by Holy Spirit, of course, that we would not um, speak um, foolish or, or, or useless things, but we would um, speak those things that God wants us to speak in those situations and see things happen and change in Jesus' name. Yeah, Lincoln, that's really good. I, I wanted to just to double back on that false humility because mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I've i had it, I've seen it, and it's yeah. an enemy. It's an enemy. It's to the it is. Through. We're it being is, it is. an enemy, yeah. Yes, so, yes thank, well, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Always good to have you on, Lincoln. Thank you. Uh, Levita, we move on to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Er, good greetings to everyone. Um, just wanted to say that uh, that message from last week and even several weeks prior when Anderson was covering uh, the subject and bringing it all together again last week and picking up where he left off, what has happened is 
in the realm of the spirit by what he's releasing. This message is global for sure. Of course, that's part of our name here, uh, the Global Kingdom Conversation. But what's happening is, as this word is being released, God is sowing it into the hearts of people and identity crises are being annihilated. And it's the fire of God. Our God is a consuming fire. So everyone who had mistaken identity, false identity, or an identity crisis is being burned up by the Holy Ghost. And I see it and it's global and it's exciting. Uh, Tim sent out a um, email last night to his, uh, his followers for the Ecclesia Center. And that was just as powerful as what I see uh, God doing with the words that Anderson has been releasing here as they're going into our hearing. And as you said, to the unseen audience on YouTube and anyone we share this playback with, it's being released into the atmosphere to a degree and in the realms of the spirit in the heavenlies to a degree that it's impacting nations everywhere on the planet. And that's what God wants to accomplish. And it's exciting uh, to no longer be confused about who you belong to, why you exist and what you were created to do while you're on the planet. Those issues are being resolved. Keep, keep this global conver kingdom conversation going. Keep it going. I'm excited if you can't tell. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you on, uh, Navita. And one of the things that I think it's important for us to to remember, uh, particularly those of us that have uh, only seen one way of receiving healing and receiving impartation, is the fact that inside of these presentations. You can have an interface with God right as these things are, are going. And, and that's what I'm talking about. You're telling me. Yeah, we can in. be challenged, right? <laughs> we can be challenged right there. And so you're tapping yeah. in. All right. That's well, good. Thank, thank you, you so much, Vita. It's always good having you on. Thank I'm you gonna, so much. I'm gonna call uh for David Castro. David, uh may I have some words from uh, last week and impact you may have had you'd like to share with us. Welcome, David. And so welcome, Kelvin. Um you know, I said last week, and I'll, I'll repeat it again today, what has really leaped out, just a, a high jump in this message that uh, Anderson has brought to us is the fact that the sonship and the word adoption, when it was used by Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was in the context of emperors, men that were in authority of a, leading a government and a nation who did not have an heir, so then they would adopt a child, so that child would continue the legacy of the rulership and, and the governmental uh, place of that emperor. It, it would continue with that adopted child. Now that's what leaped out at me. And that's what God is. God's not religion and all this fuzzy, fuzzy little things we want to feel. And, and, you know, and, and, and God has been by religion has been put in such a place that almost religion doesn't talk about a governmental God, unless it's from the perspective of perspective of legalism. But God is a governmental authority. What Levita was just saying it's, it, is, is, is as this gets released, there's, a, there's an authority that is being released, setting people free. That's governmental. And, and this message of adoption and sonship, uh, we need to really, really receive it as God is speaking to us about our place, our calling within his kingdom, dominion within his governmental place 
of governing the earth. He created Adam to govern, to rule, to subdue, to reign, not to have a bunch of religious fuzzy, fuzzy little things. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was all about government. And that's what has stood out. And, and I believe that uh, the more that we're able to zero in on that, then we can also see the purpose why we were created. Lincoln was saying how this is helping him to see the purpose. Well, you've got to realize that God has created us and, and he redeemed us in Christ for the purpose of government. He's given us authority to rule, to establish kingdom. And, and we have to speak, we have to think, we have to walk in that frame of mind, not the old wine of religion and, and what religion has been uh, for hundreds of years uh, proclaiming. So this is what stood out to me. Uh, I said it last week and I will say it again today. And uh, I've been spending quite a few hours digesting this powerful message that Anderson has brought. Uh, also on foundation, he spoke to us about foundation uh, and what it had to do with what happened with Adam and also the other word that has to do with the beginning. It's two separate things. When you understand that, it is powerful. It is powerful what the plan of redemption is all about. So these are just some thoughts, Kelvin. Thank you for calling and, and asking. And uh, I just pray that those of us on this call are really getting the switch flipped about God's kingdom and government. We, we need to get out of this religious conversation with this religious connotation and intonation. Uh, we, we've got to get into the governmental aspect of God's kingdom. We're citizens. We're not members. We're, we're called to build a nation uh, and to govern and to rule. So that's all governmental talk. And I really appreciate Anderson for presenting this. Looking forward to him finishing it. Yes, uh, David, absolutely. Thank you uh, for what you've shared here and the impact that, and the, the thing that he started off with Anderson last time was uh, as long as the heir remains a child. Um, it's very, very important because the child uh, has to be informed and the child has to see and the child has to, to collect the fact that, hey, I have been brought into a context. This is how I'm to function. This is how I'm to live. And he has to move away from that, that child level. And like you mentioned, David, about the, the religious conversation, and this is a governmental conversation. And so, absolutely. So there has to be some work done on the, on the individual to accept and to see and to embrace what we've been called to, because clearly our movement, you, you see this with uh, Lot's wife. She was supposed to be migrating with, with the family and looking back, you know, what would be the reason for, for that to look back? We have affinity, we have nostalgia, all this stuff that we have to, to deal with and look at to keep us moving forward and, and to have the kind of right understanding of the context that God has called us to. So thank you for that, David. Thank you Tell for that. Tell me if I may. Yes. Uh -huh. I just um, add on to um, this conversation. Um, what I would like to suggest, and I haven't looked, I don't know whether Anderson is on right now or not, but if he could go back to that rites of passage dialogue that he taught us several, several weeks ago, I think he needs to refresh that in the hearts of the people and even for purposes of the video and playback that rites of passage teaching, right? I think that was very near the beginning when he first opened up the sonship and the adoption. Um, that rites of passage stuff was, oh, that was fresh. Okay, thank yeah. you, thank you, Anderson. Yeah. Um, but I think if we could get a refresher on that to bring it all into the loop together, it would be phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely, Vita. We have to be able to, 
to, to, you know, you can't hear these things one time and that's it. You know, you can't hear it one time and then just say, I've got it. These things have to really, really, I know for myself have to be rehearsed over and over again, because for me, I see Jeremiah, the tearing down, the pulling down, the throwing down, the, you know, the destroying, all of those kind of things, then the building and the planting. So there's a lot that has to be unlearned and untaught and released and, you know, deliberately walked out. So uh, thank you very much for those of you that had uh, something to say this morning. Thank you for your input. Uh, I want Anderson to, to take over now and, and just uh, share what's on his heart regarding the sonship. It is so, so good. I see Ivan has his hand up. Ivan, you want to get in here? Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, that Anderson said something about the Ecclesia. You said, without understanding son, who we are as sons, the Ecclesia does not get momentum. It does not grow. It does not get established. If we don't understand sonship, God's kingdom doesn't get expanded. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because we either take on the mentality of a slave or a servant, and we don't fully manifest who we are as God's sons. And then we understand what it means to exercise the authority that God gives us in a way that's humble, gentle, peaceful, um, uh, bold, courageous. So uh, I really appreciated Anderson's comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I agree. First things first, can't put the cart before the horse. There are building blocks to this thing. And, and if they're out of sequence, we'll find uh, ourselves, you know, running into a wall. So uh, uh, these foundations need to be laid again, rehearsed, gone over again, over again, and over again, because we're going to be challenged to move forward and migrate in these truths. They have to be established inside of us. And it just, this is not by hearing and then reciting, but they really have to be something that we see and, uh, and that transforms us. So thank you for that, Ivan. Andy, we're, we're ready. Uh, if you are on that end, you should be all set for your presentation. I'm all set, man, I'm all set. Um, oh, sorry, sorry for that, it's my bad. Um, I think, good evening, everybody. Um, <laughs> I think Levita is um, totally on point in terms of us kind of um, going back and, and um, rehearsing those elements on the rites of passage. I, I sent uh, Fred an, a private note on the chat to see if he could um, queue up that particular thought. Fred, you there? Are you there, Frederick? Hi, yeah, I, I yeah, am yeah, around. You, Sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in work still. So I've got okay, to work so, and listen right. at the same time. Well, maybe we could, we, we, could, we could jump onto that maybe next week or so. Um, but I think Levita is totally on point in terms of us um, jumping back on it because I have in fact on a few occasions just quick let's make a quick reference to Frederick's presentation he writes a passage but it was just a very quick um uh, reference to it without drilling into it but um I think that that we need to go back and and rehearse that again so that we could almost like recontextualize a lot of the things that we are saying regarding um sonship let me um through, through this presentation up here today and um, get into this. Um, let me know if you could see my screen. Yes, we can see okay. it. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something here that I don't I don't want. Okay, but let me go with that then. All right, I think we're good. All right, now now today's presentation, if at all, um, if at all I could really get a lot more interaction, then I want to amend the second part of this. Um, I actually had. The second part of this, there are two things that we want to cover today. <laughs> one is the issue of just getting back to that element of Abba Father. And the other one I want us to talk about is just discovering the very character of the Father. Because um, you can't be a son without a father, obviously. But in, in, my, in my presentation, in terms of my own preparation, sorry, I kind of um, drilled a little bit too deep. And uh, a lot of things were just kind of firing at me at, at, at almost like a fusillade level, just fast and furious. And I wanted to step back because um, what I don't want is for these presentations to become inundated with information 
uh, but but there are certain aspects of it I want you to more or less kind of um, lend your sight into giving shape and form to it, because this is in fact called a kingdom conversation, and so it's it's not just a matter of me talking, you listening, but it's a matter of us talking one with the other. And so the second part of this, I deliberately pulled back. I had a step back for several reasons, most of which I don't want to mention in this call. It has all kinds of reasons why I deliberately stepped back. And um, if I could give you some of the reasons why, because uh, um, it, it began to address issues that are very, very, very dear to my own heart. It began to address issues that, um, that based on experiences that I've had, it began to address issues about, about uh, um, charlatans within the structure of, 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 of the church who are posturing as fathers. And I found that I was kind of getting a little bit too aggressive in those areas. And so I kind of deliberately pulled back. And, um, and so the second part of this, I want some of us to kind of uh, <laughs> lend our sight and lend our understanding into making the second part of this presentation a little bit more appropriate for all of us to walk away with values. So let me get into this and um, talk about what we looked into last week. In our last conversation, that would have been last week, we identified five areas that we wanted to cover. And the five areas were one, we talked about a truism. I'm gonna throw that truism back up just to remind us of it. A truism is a statement of fact that cannot actually be denied. And um, this is just one of several quotes that I push out every now and again. There was a time when I was very buoyant on Twitter. I deliberately took a step back on Twitter. And uh, back in the day, I'll just throw a provocative comment and jump off. And um, I've not been on Twitter for about near to two years or so, but I will in fact jump back on and throw a couple more truisms on top there. But the first thing we, we mentioned last week was a truism. The second thing we did last week, we did a, a succinct scan of the term adoption and we went back into some of the historical and political uh, aspects and issues associated with the word adoption. And we walked through that very quickly, maybe about five slides or so were assigned to that particular issue. The third thing we started doing was contextualizing the adoption metaphor. And in doing that, we said there are four areas in the New Testament where Paul, Paul actually is the architect of the concept in terms of bringing this idea to bear inside of a New Testament conversation. And so Paul identified four areas. There are four areas in the Bible where this word adoption is in fact introduced to us. And every one of those instances speak very, very profoundly to certain areas that we must have embedded in our consciousness. And so we looked at three of them and we said we leave the fourth one for another time and we maybe jump onto that another time. The fourth thing that we wanna talk about is what we're gonna jump into today, the issue of Abba and number five, the heart of the father. And we wanna talk about the prodigal. And um, so let's try to get those two issues done very, very quickly today. This is the truism that we that we pushed last week and uh very important very real conversation and i think if we if we understand it it really speaks to the need for us to make some serious personal amendment amendments in our individual lives and wherever we have areas of responsibility within the structure of the ecclesia wherever it would express itself and this is the this is the this is the word a self-indulgent, manichaean, colonized, self-righteous, divided, and obsessively religious church will always fail in its effort to project a moral imperative on the world. And um, if you were to sit down and walk through that, it really puts a demand upon all of us to become less self-indulgent, for us to become less manichaean, for us to become less colonized and be more independent for us to become less self-righteous, less divided and less obsessively uh, religious so that we can really be, be, be impactful 
in terms of our evangelistic responsibilities and bringing a very significant kingdom impact to bear in the areas where we have influence, et cetera. But that's a very important truism that I want you to take note of. Now let's jump into some of the issues of today's presentation. Two things we want to get done. The first thing I want to talk about is the issue of Abba Father. And this is Galatians chapter four, verses four to seven. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, <laughs> born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you're an heir through God. I have a lot of stuff inside of there that we could unpackage, but we are all mature here. A lot of this stuff, we don't need to regurgitate and rehearse, but let's get into the whole issue of this idea of God being a father and us being sons and the responsibility we have to refer to him as Abba. Now listen to me. The concept of God, you know, God, conveys the image of bigness and grandness on a scale that is almost unreachable, unfathomable. You know, it, it feels almost ungraspable. It feels unattainable. It seems so impersonable. And this image of God seems so strangely enigmatic. You know, when we talk about God, is this big, grand, uh, insurmountable, image or personal being so far over yonder and there's a bigness to it that seems almost too herculean and too big for us to get close to and um and and, and there is that thing about god where his ideas and the breath of insight the breath of understanding is unfathomable isaiah talks about that and we know that his bigness and his grandness makes us small in all kinds of ways and all kinds of dynamic areas inside of there. But the thing is, if God remains this God so far removed from us, it almost cancels out and it, it, it reduces the impact of redemption. It reduces the impact of, 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 um, of salvation. It reduces and cancels and minimizes the impact of the second Adamness that we are walking in. That's an important principle, huh? because as big and as grand as he is, as long as God stays so far removed and remote, where everything about him is so unfathomable, unattainable, unreachable, ungraspable, it, it, it makes salvation nothing more than a religious experience. It makes redemption nothing more than a religious experience because God redeems us basically to stand so far from him and not to fully experience him at a proximate level. And so what God did is almost like he helped us with this and brought us into a, a, a broader understanding and a more personal understanding. And so Father, as opposed to God, and more so Abba Father, brings this bigness into reachable distance without diluting and diminishing his largeness. And I get that because it's important. Because the idea of God feels so big and unfathomable, so unattainable. And so God brought us into relationship with him. So almost to cancel out this unreachableness associated with that whole concept that religion has foisted upon us. And so when we think of God being a father, and I'm going to say it again, God being our father, it takes the remoteness out of the experience. It takes the unfathomable, the unfathom, unfathomableness out of the experience. It takes the impersonableness out of the experience. It takes the strange enigmaticness out of the experience. And it brings everything close, very personal, very intimate, very proximate, very relatable, and very relational. 
And that's important because when we talk about God being our father and we being sons, it has stuff inside of there. Let me put this in a very simple image and listen to me. And in this image, <coughs> I want to almost look at other concepts out of the image. But the point I want you to get is breaking the remoteness and making things personal. It's no longer just, just an ambiguous God. He is now my father. He is not just an, an ambiguous, enigmatic God. He is my father. And the concept of Abba Father brings the bigness of God into reachable distance without minimizing his grandness. Now, look at this image here. This image here speaks to the earth and its relationship to the sun, a very important concept. And let me put it this way. The distance from the earth's surface to the sun is 94 million miles. Those of you who would have done geography and science, this is information that's at your fingertips. The distance from the earth's surface to the sun is 94 million miles. And the temperature of the sun's surface is 9,500 Fahrenheit. That thing is seriously hot. Even from a distance, you'll be parched. Even from a distance. Now, hold that basic piece of information in your mind. That that sun, it is so far away. And it is so untouchable, unreachable, even trying to get close to it would parch you and disintegrate you because it is so powerful. But look at, look at the images that we have right in front of us. Now, here is another image. This other image is the earth and the very core of the earth. And so if you look at that second image, you see the earth, the very surface of the earth, going all the way down to the literal core. And this is the principle you have to get. The distance from the Earth's surface to its core is only 1,800 miles. Only 1,800 miles. But this is the point that blew me away when I first discovered this. The temperature at the core of the Earth is the same as the Sun's surface. What is the principle? The principle is quite interesting. Can you imagine the same power that is 94 million miles away is brought close and is just beneath our feet? But if you try to go 1,800 miles away from the sun, you won't even get close to it. You will be destroyed. However, we could walk, our, we could walk on the earth barefooted. We could run around this earth and experience all that same distant power right very close. And here are some of the principles that I want to unpackage there for all of us. It has stuff that I want you to understand. Principle number one, when power comes close, it should be safe and unintimidating. And that's the first point I want you to get. By looking at those two images, the point I want you to get is when power comes close, it is safe or it should be safe and unintimidating. Or that first thing I want you to see there, think about God being a father. That's power coming close. You could sit on his lap. This is the same God who created the heavens and the earth and the universe and one statement from his mouth and things move and things are created and stuff happens. But that same big God would allow us to come close, come before his throne of grace and engage him. When power comes close, it should be safe and unintimidating. Now, don't see that only in the context of big God, but take, take that in the context of you being a leader. You see, if power comes close and proximate to people, it should always be safe and unintimidating. Get the point. If you as a leader comes close to an individual or members or people around you and they feel intimidated by you and unsure, something is unclean about that whole relationship. Because all of us can go to big God who is our father and we don't feel intimidated by his bigness and his largeness. When power comes close, it should be safe and unintimidating. Here's the second point. When proximate power behaves like remote power, systems are majorly out of balance, hurts, pains, and catastrophes become inevitable. In other words, you are nothing more than a leader. You are remote power, but you want to behave like the sun way out there. You're hard to reach. You can't be found. And if ever people get even close to you, you want to destroy them. 
When proximate power behaves like remote power, systems are majorly out of balance. The point is, God does not relate to us like that. And the third and very important point, power must clothe itself with inviting and aesthetic elements in order to remove the fear and intimidating factor and welcome engagement. Let me say that again. Power must clothe itself with inviting and aesthetic elements. The reason why you could walk on the Earth's surface and the, the power of the sun resides only 1,800 feet beneath you, and that is no longer intimidating. You know why? Because life is filled with all this beauty. It has all this stuff around us that allows us not to feel intimidated. You could see beauty and majesty and grandeur and order and magnificence in front of our gaze. And all of that is inviting. I have a lot of stuff on staying there, but I want you to understand. Power must clothe itself with inviting and aesthetic elements. Our natural world is like that. And if you are a leader, the same principle must apply. Because if you carry the power of God or the anointing of God or the summons of God within your heart, then you must clothe that thing with inviting and aesthetic elements like love and gentleness and care, consideration, people empowering, people empowering, those kinds of values is what makes the power within you to be inviting, to be unintimidating, to be less fearful, and it makes the whole process very engaging and meaningful. And the final point, unimpeded and un, un, unrestrained power is catastrophic on a grand scale. You have any level of power and you cannot Properly manage that. You are completely insane. You are manipulative and controlling. That thing will always result in some serious catastrophic outcomes. Now, those four principles, I want you to hold on to those four concepts because I'm not talking about science. I'm not talking about the Earth's surface. I'm just giving you natural parallels to describe eternal realities because that is how it works. The power that is at the core of the earth, that is not some kind of casual power. Every now and again, it gives us a little sense of how powerful it is. Every time there's a volcanic eruption, that is a sense of the power that lies just beneath you, but it's not intimidating because all of that is clothed in all kinds of inviting and aesthetic elements that basically says, enjoy it, come close to it, interact with it, take value from it. And that's what leadership and human life ought to be like. Whenever you have leaders that make you feel uncertain, unsure, intimidating, these are pitiful human beings walking around trying to become even better than God because not even God behaves like that. Hold that thought right there. Because we try to have a number upon God because God does not treat us like this. Somehow our relationship with our heavenly father must become a model for some of those earthly men who run around wanting to be our fathers. And that brings us into a very important part of this conversation. Let's talk about all of this in the context of Abba Father. Remember, I use the image of the earth's surface from the sun in relation to the earth's surface and its core as an example of big God that feels so remote versus that big God coming close being a father. The issue of father is bigness that is now proximate, largeness that, was, that is within touchable business, distance. Abba Father speaks to relationship. It speaks to proximity. It speaks to closeness. It speaks to an unintimidating environment. And that thing ought to at least provoke the way in which you pray, the way in which you posture yourself before God, it, it, it affects your heart condition, it affects your conversations, your perspectives, your God view, your world view, and your people view. And that's very important. Now let's talk about this issue of Abba Father. Now Abba, originally what Abba is a possessive noun in Aramaic. You know that the New Testament was in fact written not in Greek, but in Aramaic. It was originally written in Aramaic. The word Abba is a possessive noun in um, Aramaic, and it is best read as my father. When you see the word Abba, this is highly personal. Abba is not just like a, a, a babbling statement. It is a statement in Aramaic, and at its root is 
my father, very personal, not this remote big God out there, not this big creator way over yonder. This is a very personal, up close, very tender and very proximate statement. Abba, a personal, a possessive pronoun, sorry, in Aramaic that basically speaks to my father. Abba removes the remoteness. It removes the far awayness from God and brings him close within personal reach. Now that ought to affect the way in which you relate to him. It immediately removes the religious component out of it. It removes, remember I said at the beginning that if God continues to be this God, big God far over yonder, it, 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 it somehow dilutes the experience of redemption. It dilutes the experience of salvation. It dilutes the experience of God coming to us in order to bring us back to a condition that Adam forfeited. It dilutes that because as long as God continues to be this remote, far over yonder God, all we have left is a religious experience, nothing personal, nothing transformative, nothing proximate, nothing real. It is just another religious experience. And far too many believers are running down the, running around the earth talking about their relationship with God, when in reality, there's no relationship at all because he's still too remote and distant He's still too far away. It's not a real experience. It's a religious rhythm that we have basically switched on and we have not been able to switch off. So the first point I want you to get is that, listen, when you say Abba, there's a possessive pronoun and it really ought to be best read as my father. Abba puts the emphasis on my father and not the father, not the father. In other words, this word Abba removes the generic composite. That is not just the father, because listen, while he is the father of all that exists, there is a distinction between God being the father of all that exists and God being my father by virtue of I being adopted in the beloved. That's a dynamic thing altogether. Abba is not just the father, it's my father. It is not a generic concept. This is very specific. It's very personal. Again, Simple, but I want you to understand that when you look at these concepts, it ought to affect how you pray, how you worship, how you engage him. It affects the level of your anticipation, the way in which you you look for results, because uh, even Jesus said, you don't go and ask for your father, your earthly father for X, and he gives you Y. Something about God being a father affects your anticipation component. How do I ask my father knowing that he will respond in a particular way? This word Abba, the common meaning of Abba in Aramaic is the flesh and blood father. The word has a very complex Aramaic word. It's a complex Aramaic word because it speaks to a flesh and blood father, but the strongest personal type, personalized term or the metonym, metonym is like a replacement word. This is like a metonym for God. So when you standing as an individual in New Testament, speaking the language of Aramaic and you use the word Abba, you are not removing the bigness of God out of the equation because the word Abba was in fact a metonym for God. So not only does the word Abba mean my father as opposed to the father, the word also speaks of God, my father. The big God is close to me. The grand creator of all that exists lives close, lives within touchable distance. I could turn and relate to him. And as big as he is, as omnipresent as he is, he's very personal and real to me. That affects the way I worship him. It affects the way I call upon him. I don't need to run into a building to lift my hands and call that worship. My prayer to him is not more profound when I stand in a church building in front of an altar, some proverbial space to the front of a building. I'm talking about something that is real, that occurs deep within the chambers of my heart as I relate to this God who is personal and real. Abba is not just an arbitrary concept. This is God my father. You see, Abba, God, my father, does exist, uh, it does insist rather on respect, reverence, and regard while encouraging proximity, affinity, 
familiarity and family. And that's the dynamic things that are buried inside of there. When you say God, you are saying, when you say Abba, God, my father, it has all these nuances embedded inside of this Aramaic word because the word insists on respect, reverence, awe, and regard. But at the same time, it encourages proximity and affinity, familiarity and family and confidence and boldness. These are complex terms, very, very dynamic term that should inform and inspire and provoke the way in which we really, really engage him. Listen to me further. Abba, in the book of Romans, and let me kind of pull the scripture, but I think the order of it is wrong. So here what Romans 8 verse 15 says. So you have not received a spirit that makes you, makes you a fearful slave. You have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. And you see that word fearful? That is something that is so deeply embedded inside of our Christianity. That's the reason why we, we, we bring eschatology into the mix. Most of the times when preachers bring eschatology into the mix, the thing is not designed to give people a sense of how Christ will reveal himself because the essence of revelation is not the unfolding of events, it is the revealing of Christ. But when we talk about eschatology and the emphasis is the unfolding of events, what we're trying to do is to create a sense of fear and intimidation. The book of Revelation speaks about the unveiling of who Christ is, not the unfolding of earthly events. That is not important to us at all. And so fear has become a major component in the way leaders posture themselves, the way in which we enforce discipline, the way in which we, we, we restore, and I put that word restore in inverted commas, the way we restore fallen brothers. Everything we do within Christianity is overloaded with fear and intimidation. From the time someone even walks into our church building, even how we got them there started with fear because the whole message of hell is again over, overloaded with this fear component. Christianity, as we know it today, is a fear-driven kind of entity. So hear what Roman says again. You have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. In other words, guys, this is, this is not a matter of the sun way out there that we are so intimidated by it that if we only step beyond a little bit outside of the earth dimension, we would be fried. That is what that big grand distant sun says to us. You only move too far from where you should be, you'll be fried. And so we have this image of God with a big stick, only there to discipline and punish. And that stuff has informed so much of what we call apostolic. It has informed so much of our message, so much of our evangelism. You have not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba. That word Abba, right here in Romans, Paul is contrasting the enslaved with the adopted. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave, but you've received a spirit where you've been, when you've been adopted. Therefore, you call him Abba, Father. The very clear principle is, from Paul's perspective, you're either adopted or you're a slave. The Abba Father basically allows us to live inside of the adopted. If you can't live there, then you still see God. Big, you still see a big stick God. You still see a God who is there to discipline, not to love. You see a God who about to, to judge you and condemn you and castigate, not a God who calls you close. That whole image has corrupted so much about who we are. It has influenced our prayer. It has influenced our conduct. It has influenced our fellowship. We live from a place of servitude and bondage. You did not receive the spirit that makes you a slave. You've received the spirit when, he, when you were adopted that makes you cry out, Abba, Father. From Paul's perspective, you're either adopted or you're a slave. Abba Father is the expression of the adopted. Listen to me further. This Aramaic or Semitic term was used when a slave with joy was adopted and allowed to call his former master Abba. So if you were living inside of that particular era, the origin of this particular concept is where you were once a slave. 
but you were not brought into the family. You were adopted into the family, and part of the adoption protocol is that you no longer have to refer to your former master as master. Now you have the right to call him by this affectionate term, Abba, a privileged term, Abba. Only members of the family, only if you had his own genes were you allowed to refer to him as Abba. So when you were a slave and you are brought into the family and you now have the right to call him Abba, you understand all kinds of dynamics are taking place in your household. Imagine I am your, I am, I, I happen to be a son by virtue of birth, and you are brought into the family and you have the right to call my father. Abba, there's all kinds of intimidation could be addressed right there. And we're going to get to that intimidation when we get to the, to, to the prodigal. These are real issues and it's a privilege, but it has all kinds of stuff that happens inside of that particular domain where a slave is brought into a household and he has the right to call his former master this most affectionate term, Abba. The point I want you to get is this, Abba, is a dynamic change in your relationship with the Lord. You see, he, he could be your master, he could be your Lord, he could be all this stuff. But when you begin to call him Abba, it means that you move from Masa to Abba. Masa was the way in which the slaves called their slave owner, Masa, Masa, because some of them could not even use the city word master. And so when we talk about this radical shift in your relationship with the Lord, you get rid of that slave mentality. God is not Massa, he is Abba. And that's a nice term <coughs> to ring in your spirit. He is not Massa, he is Abba. And that simple little shift in your perspective ought to change the way in which you see this God. He is not far removed, so difficult to the grasp and so hard to get to, but I have to pull my hair out like these prophets of Baal upon Mount Carmel trying to get the attention of this God and I have to shake and shiver. I have to change my accent and my tone. I have to hiss like a snake. And no, this is, this is a God who's close. He's my father. This is my daddy. This is my God. He's big and grand, but this is God, my father. And if you can only take this first part of this presentation, and import it into your, your dialect with the Lord. If you could import it into your perspective and your conversation, I, I, I assure you there should be some degree of major change in the way in which your prayer, your worship, your engagement, your dialogue, your, 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 your whole interaction with the things of the Spirit. This is God, my Father. Abba signals a dynamic change in your relationship with the Lord. From Massa to Abba. Listen to me. Now that perspective change, that perspective change from Massa to Abba affects all dimensions of your interface with God. That simple change. Because somewhere in our minds, we still have this weird concept that this big God so unattainable, this big grand God, so unreachable, so unfathomable. I am in my church service and I have to try so hard to get to this unattainable God. No, that is not the nature of the relationship that the Father has brought us into. That perspective change from Master to Abba, it affects every dimension of your interface with God, every dimension. Every aspect, it affects how you relate to your brothers. It affects how you relate to your families, your loved ones. It affects how you relate to the world. It affects your evangelism. It affects your kingdom perspective and your kingdom persuasion. That simple shift, this is not Massa. This is Abba. You see, it changes our prayer from beggarliness to negotiations. When you are no longer this, this, this slave, listen, you no longer have to beg. As a slave, you beg, oh, oh, Massa, oh, 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 Massa, is it, is it, is it possible, Massa, that I could get just maybe help out your little slave here with some little small portion of goodness? No, you're not begging. That shift in perspective changes your whole engagement from beggarliness to negotiation. You see that word negotiation? That's a profound concept, profound concept. 
a couple of weeks ago, we've been teaching on a Monday night on just revisiting the dynamics of prayer and engaging God and, and something that we discovered about the power of negotiations. Prayer is more than just an empty dialect where we have a screaming contest with the devil. That's how we think prayer is, a screaming contest with, contest with the devil, or we're trying to push God up against the wall and demand what we believe is all right by virtue of salvation. That is not what prayer is. Prayer is a dynamic negotiation. And if you understand that we are no longer dealing with a massa, we're not dealing with Father, our entire engagement with God moves from beggarliness to negotiations. And it gives us a seat at the legislative table in the amelioration of the earth's affair. And that's important stuff right there, guys, because we are members of a legislative council. Hence, you have the idea of a, 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 an ecclesia. That, that, is, that, that gives us language. It gives us access. It gives us authority. It uh, allows us to relate to God in a very, very dynamic way. Get me further. God is not building an army. Yes, he is, but not necessarily. He's not building an army. He's building a family. And this stuff is so profoundly real to me. God is not building an army as much as he's building a family which, in which he is father and we are adopted. Now, that's, here's another twister. He is building an unusual kingdom, an unusual kingdom where he is king, but we are not subjects. He is king and we are sons. Can you imagine a kingdom where he is king? We are not subjects, but we are sons. In other words, the kingdom that God is building, we are all blue-blooded in that kingdom. We are all blue-blooded. We all royalty. Because this is not a kingdom where there's peasants and there is the bourgeois. It is not a kingdom where it has this, this distinction between the elites and the insignificant. That is not the kingdom he's building. He's building a kingdom where he is king, but he is father and we are sons. I want you to go back and read at some point, Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, we have this interesting scripture that most of us are very familiar with, where Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Don't just read 6.33, read the verses before, where the essence of the, of the conversation is this. You who are running around the earth as believers, you are living out of a puny faith composite where you think that all of life is begging for things. Jesus said, this is what the heathens do. And this is the point that Jesus stressed here, I mean, he said, listen, even the birds of the air are clothed in ways that will make Solomon look like nothing. Your heavenly father knows that you need this stuff. Your heavenly father, he kept emphasizing what your heavenly father will do for you and can do for you and is concerned about and concerning you. Your heavenly father. It is in the context of Jesus talking about the power of a heavenly father that he says, seek first the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom is not this arbitrary little domain where God is this king and we are little subjects and peasants running around, just kind of abjectly holding on to his every law. No, he is a king, but he is my father. I am a son within this kingdom. This is a blue-blooded environment where we are all subject to a state of, 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 of royalty. That's a different kind of world altogether. Well, that thing ought to at least explode in your heart and mind because we're not just arbitrary individuals running around the earth just trying to sustain or maintain some kind of religious dogma. That stuff has been absolutely injurious to everything about the faith. That whole idea of a distant God, it has messed up our whole conversation with one another. This concept of, an, of, a, of a punitive God, it has affected our concept of authority. So you have men running around the earth who believes authority is punishment, who believe authority is just deactivating individuals, who believe authority is delegitimizing individuals. That is not authority. That is absolute foolishness. And if any one of you on this call is still subject to that level of leadership, I tell you, run as fast as your little legs can carry you away from that nonsense. That's not the order of God. So that gives us a little insight into the nature, <laughs> into the dynamics of Abba Father. Now let's talk quickly about the prodigal. I pull back on this, but 
I really want to get a couple of things in. And for this, we're going to do some reading. It's important we read all of it. Now, listen, before I get there, I want to say a few things. Listen, we have developed a hypocritical religion that believes that God's grace and Calvary's power are sufficient to transform a sinner, but woefully inadequate to restore a brother. Do you write that down? And that there is as explosive a comment as anything I've said today. We have developed a hypocritical religion that believes that the grace of God and Calvary's power, it is sufficient to transform a sinner. We believe that, listen, I don't care. We could tell people, I don't care what you did in this life. Praise God. And if you are a sinner, if you're a hypocrite, you could be a prostitute. You could be a murderer. The grace of God will find you. But then you come to church and you make the smallest act of discretion. And for some strange reason, the same grace that was able to restore a sinner is now inadequate to transform a believer. We would send that believer to hell. We would destroy that individual's life. We would create all kinds of rigorous, unbiblical systems of church discipline. We do all kinds of, all kinds of antics that we call systems of transformation. And at the end, we destroy people's lives because somehow this simple little concept is not embedded inside of a punitive religious disposition that we've created where God is so far. Ah, and we can't relate it. We have developed a hypocritical religion that believes that God's grace and Calvary's power, it is sufficient to transform a sinner, but it is woefully insufficient to restore a brother. Whatever that brother, not whatever who he, whatever, whatever circumstance he's in. You know, we, we, we can easily see someone walk into our church doors and say, oh, that person was a murderer. And it is easy for us to know that the grace of God could transform them. But then a person walks in the door and he steals $10 and we could never forget, never forgive that individual for the rest of that person's life. He has to live with that shame of an act he, co he, co he committed where the whole church just cannot see the grace of God is sufficient to cover that too. We just can't see it. We just can't see it. Now listen to me. Listen to me. This is the Wycliffe Bible. And I'm talking about the prodigal here. This is the Wycliffe Bible. It says, uh, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. And I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Him from whom every fatherhood is named that is in heaven and in earth. Him from whom every fatherhood. Now, the point I want you to get in us walking through the prodigal is that your, your knowledge or your perspective or your awareness or your conviction of being a son is, is not switched on by your awareness that, well, okay, I'm a son or the grace of God found me, but you could only acknowledge your sonship when you perceive his fatherhood. You cannot understand who you are because the truth is even our earthly fathers were incapable of demonstrating the quality of fatherhood that God demonstrates in us. So you can't say, well, I could look at father through, through the lens of my father. Some of us don't have that kind of example. Maybe some of you would have had the best possible human fathers that you could ever celebrate, and it becomes a good image, but as good as it is, it is not sufficient. So the principle that Ephesians is giving to us from the Wycliffe translation is that God is not just a father. He's not just a father, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he is the model of all fatherhood. And that immediately brings us into this simple realization. True fathering gets its definition from God. And what I want us to do as we walk through the scriptures about the prodigal, I want you to see what true fathering is. But more than this, listen, we have to look at what earthly fathers supposed to be because not only is he the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he is the standard from which all fatherhood derives its, mean, its meaning. So earthly fathers. And so the point that I want you to get is that from our earthly father, the principle I learned from Matthew chapter one is this, mothers give birth, fathers beget. When you look at the genealogy in, the, in, in Matthew chapter one, you'll see, and, 
you'll see a whole list of those who beget. And Abraham beget this one, and this one beget that one. And what you realize is that it's a whole list of men. Whole list of men. You always ask, well, where are the mothers? Because the truth is, mothers give birth. Fathers beget means get your sons to be. And a true father is engaged in begetting, getting your sons to become and walk in the fullness of what they should be. That doesn't cancel out the role of mothers. It doesn't minimize the role of mothers. But at the core of a patriarchal document called the Bible, you'd realize the emphasis placed in the, genealog the, the genealogical record that Abraham is the one who beget Isaac. Isaac beget, and it's a very dynamic concept because if you look at the patterns in God and you try to mirror those patterns within yourself, then it's a very big responsibility. The other thing is the pattern of fathering that you see in God must also influence our spiritual fathers. Now I put spiritual fathers in inverted commas because the truth is no man should run around demanding that they be called their father. I find that the term has become almost like a term of manipulation and trying to demand of certain people to kind of pledge loyalty and allegiance to you. And so what we call mentoring and fathering in some contexts is where some people are trying to manipulate people to stay loyal to them until they die. It's a, it's a tool of manipulation. And so I put spiritual fathers in inverted commas because that thing is being abused left, right, and center. Jesus said, don't call any man father. Don't call any man father. And so we still uh, still have this concept of a spiritual father or men in the earth who are models of God patterns for us. Here's a scripture that I found was interesting. Huh? Um, you ever heard about Josiah? Josiah's physical father was a guy called Edom, I think it was. I, try, I forgot his name. Um, but, but Josiah had a physical father. But the Bible said about Josiah that, that he walked in the ways of his father, David. He walked in the ways of his father, David. David was not his father. And so when we think about spiritual father, a spiritual father may not necessarily be the pastor that you currently go, that you currently submit to. Your spiritual father may not be the reverend that you attend church by. Your spiritual father is that individual, that human agent who would have brought about some level of influence or brought correct patterns and behavior into your life that you could function and think and act in a certain way that is more godly. And so a father, a spiritual father in that regard, if ever there is one, he provides patterns for correct behavior and correct functionality. So for Josiah, whose earthly father was not David, what Josiah saw was a man, David, providing him with patterns for proper leadership, patterns for proper kingship, proper patterns for proper government. And that is what Josiah saw in David. And so he bypassed the one who gave him birth. And he identified with somebody else who was now dead. And he said, I am walking in the patterns I see in that guy. I see patterns in him. And so I'll call him my father. And I would say, listen, this guy who gave birth to me, I don't think there's much he's bringing to me. You know? And there are some spiritual leaders like that, that you could go to a church but you are getting more value from another person. You could go to this person's ministry, but you're getting more value from elsewhere. And some of us are just going to church for the sake of maintaining the rhythms, but most of your values are coming from other people. But for David, not for David, sorry, but for Josiah, fathering was not the person who gave him birth, was not the person who led him to the Lord. It was not the person who, who basically brought about the, the formative spiritual insight into their lives or the person who gave them patterns, gave him correct patterns for proper behavior and proper functionality. Now, God provides us with all the correct patterns that should govern our behavior as fathers, both physical and spiritual. Now, I looked at those principles just as a precursor to get into the whole issue of the prodigal. Now, I want us to read all of this, and in reading it, I want, I want to almost kind of make mention of a few things. This is my Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read through this and please follow me because this is loaded. If ever Jesus um, gave a parable or a story that just has 
so many layers of principles and truth that are pertinent and relevant to the current age of the church in 2023. This story of the prodigal is happens to be one of them. Listen to what Jesus said. Then he said, I'm quoting the New King James, Matthew, not Matthew, Luke 15. Then he said, I want you to read this. And when we open up for some interaction, I want you to tell me what you see inside of these verses. And then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger or the more immature of these two sons said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And interesting because inside of those traditions, it was not the norm for the younger son to demand his inheritance. Not even the older son demanded it because these inheritance, these inheritance were actually bequeathed or given at the point of death. And very often the firstborn will get a double portion of all the father's inheritance and the secondborn will just get his own portion. Very often in a family, he gets one third, one third of what was the father's inheritance. So this secondborn, very immature, he is saying, give me what is mine. And I love how this father operates. Observe how simple, let me read it again. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. Without even fighting, without trying to cripple this young boy's strides, without telling him that I won't bless you and I won't release you, I will not release you. You know, all that kind of jargon we get in church, I will not release you, I will not bless you. So simple, the father then went and divided them his livelihood. The New King James is the word livelihood. In the, in, the, in the Greek language, the word is bios, from which you get the word biology, and it means he divided his life. And you, you are immediately confronted by the character and the nature of the father. The father does not just give gifts, he gives his life. This son is demanding, give me that physical portion that belongs to me and the father without resistance. I mean, if this is like an earthly father, if that's, if that is your pastor, you go to your pastor and you tell your pastor, you know what, pastor, you know what, the Lord is calling me to go to the other church down the street. You understand how much resistance you're going to get? Remember, I started by saying that we are about to look at patterns of fatherhood that applies both to heavenly and earthly, spiritual and natural. And if we start by looking at this, first point you understand is that a father doesn't just give gifts, he gives his life. Secondly, there's no resistance. He's not trying to cripple your will. He immediately give me what belongs to me and he immediately divides his goods and he gives it to, he gives this son his life. And I like the language. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. He began to be in want. The interesting thing I want you to see here, even before we go further, because you know the story, the interesting point is that as much as the father did not even resist, did not try to give his son a bunch of current day religious and punitive jargon, I won't release you, I won't bless you, I'll curse you if you leave this ministry and die. This is the most important thing that God has ever done on the planet and you're not allowed to leave this. I mean, the father didn't do that stuff. What the father did, however, gave him, but left the door open for him to return. Gave him, left the door open, left the channels for his son to return. So it says, when the son had spent all that he had, a famine arose and he began to be in want. It says, then he went, verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him to his field to feed swines. And he would gladly, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. I've heard many people talk about how this particular son was eating pig's food. The truth is he was not even worthy of pig's food. He wanted the pig's food and no one even gave him. This guy didn't even get pig's food. I mean, you went lower than, than pig's rations that he could not even get pig's rations. But, said, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, one translation says, when he, when he became aware of who he was, when he came to himself, 
And that's the critical point, you know. Most of us don't even know who we are. When he came to himself, when he became aware of who he was, and who was he? He was the son of a father who owned so much. When he came to himself, when he became aware of who he really was, and that is our biggest hurdle to cross, because we think that we are mere members of that Pentecostal church down the street, or we are members of this network, and who you are, I'm a member of this one, and this one is my apostle, and at the end of all of our definitions, we still don't know who we are. When he came to himself, when he became aware, this was like a moment of epiphany, a revelation of who he was dawned on him. Why am I down here eating, wanting to eat pig's food? Listen, I am the son of that guy. He became aware of himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. You realize the revelation of himself started with a knowledge of who his father was in him. Observe, when he came to himself, and he didn't start by saying, but listen, I'm a, I'm a man of God, you know, I have the anointing of God. I am, listen, I am favored. I am blessed. I am big. I'm grand. A revelation of himself started with an awareness of who his father was. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father? He knew the strength of his father, the authority of his father. That was the starting point of his own self-awareness. Knowing who your father is, is the starting point of your self-awareness. Knowing who your father is, is the starting point of your self-awareness. Most of us don't know who our father is because you look in the mirror and try to get a definition of self. And it will always deceive you. Knowing who your father is, is the beginning of self-awareness. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And this guy put together a whole, uh, a whole, a whole repentance exercise. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And now when he talks about being a hired servant, you see, in, in those days, as a father with, with prestige and money and pedigree, you had slaves and slaves were the ones who live right on the compound. So you had slaves, they lived on the compound. They would be servants in your house, etc. A hired servant would live outside of the compound. So it had hired servants, slaves, and then sons. So within the pecking order, hired servants were like the lowest degree and this boy is saying, well, you know, I've committed this act of sin and things are so bad. I was high up in the order. And so I'm going to go back to my father and say, you know what, put me down to the lowest tier. I'm going to start at the lowest shredder and hope that maybe by good behavior over 15 years, I work my way back to the top. That's what religion does for us. You make a mistake in some organization, they will drop you down the tier. You are now starting back at treader number one. This is the attitude of this boy. He still, why he has a revelation of himself and he understands a little bit of who the father is, religion is still peaking and defining a whole bunch of his perspective. And so he's putting together this whole conversation. Well, well father, make me the lowest level. Put me at the lowest tier. I'll just kind of be a member in your organization again. I'll no longer be one of the top dogs. I'll just be a, a small member and I'll work my way up. That is what I call karma Christianity. Karma, you get what you deserve. You commit sin, so take your punishment. That's karma Christianity. The kingdom does not work like that. It does not work. So this boy is creating this whole scenario. And hear what it says. As he arose and he came to his father. But, but when he was still a great way off, still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You see, that is crazy stuff, right? Huh? When I say crazy stuff, that is what I call breaking the paternal, the paternal protocol. Because in those days, you're a man of dignity. You don't ever run. You walk with a certain degree of class and your shoulders square and your head, square, your head pointing in a certain direction. This father dismissed all of his paternal 
uh, protocol. You know, this is no, I'm seeing my son. This is not like a stranger. This father is seeing his son. Now remember, I'm saying, I'm not talking about just your heavenly father. I'm talking about the way we ought to relate to our people. He sees his son. He dispenses of all paternal protocols and he runs and grabs the son, fell on his neck and started to kiss him. And the son began to put together his little statement, father of sin. You read that basically, the, fa the, the father is saying, forget about it, forget about it. The, fa the son begins to say, father of sin against heaven. And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please, the father said, listen, Turn to his servants and say, bring out the best room. Now, do you see this father saying, okay, continue. Let me hear your pain. Talk a little bit more about your transgression. Write me a report about how far you have descended. What you learned during the days of eating pig's food. I want you to, I want you to assess for me exactly what brought you to this point that you came back. That is what some apostles will run you through and they'll call that restoration. That's religion. This father canceled everything in an instant, almost like cut his son short from going through this whole long, tedious little process. The, father, the son is saying, oh, father, I have sinned against you. Oh, please. The father said, forget it. Forget it. Guys, go and bring the fatted calf. His father ignored the son's entire penitent moment and turns to the servant and said, bring up the best robe. Big revelation. Who you think wore the best robe? The best robe of not the son who was returning, the best robe of the robe that the father himself wore. Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand. Which ring you think that came from? You think that was a ring he took from his son before the son left? Put a ring on his hand and put a sandal on his feet. That there represents absolute, total, 100% restoration. This boy came back with the idea, well, I will just be a little hired servant. The father said, forget about that nonsense. Forget about it. Forget about it. You are my son. You are my son. I am your father. The father did not even encourage the boy to go through this long, tedious statement of humiliation. He said, listen, bring the best rope, put it on him. And he said, more than that, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this, my son. At no point did this boy's status change. While he was eating, while he was desiring pig's food, he was still a son. This, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And then the conversation changed. Now his older son was in the field. He's the more mature one, or so we thought he was. And he came and drew near to as he and, he and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, "Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fatted calf." But this older son was angry and will not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, now, do you see that there? Lo, that's like, I mean, the boy, he could not even observe the younger son return and he is putting together who my father asked, no, no, no. <laughs> this younger son, this older son is disrespectful, dishonoring, could not even say my father. He started a condescending term. Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've been pure. I never committed sin. I'm in church every Sunday morning. I read my Bible every day. I give alms. My tithe is the first to be given to the pastor. And lo, not even my father, my father. This is righteousness that is completely diluted. Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, this son of yours observed, he despises both his brother and his father. His father is now referred to as law. And his brother is referred to as this your son, this your son. He never said my brother, because that's what self-righteousness does. That's what religion does. Religion basically makes the self-righteous despise his own brother because his brother does something that the self-righteous does not approve of. But as soon as this son of yours came 
and has devoured his livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, son, while the son calls his father, lo, the father said, son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now see this, these verses here, you could understand in reading this through, there's reasons why I, I had to cut down on the amount of slides. Has too much stuff inside of it. Let me identify a few things that I want you to get. Now, first of all, let me define the word prodigal. I wanna get some interaction so we'll get maybe two things done and do this another time. Two things, a couple of things I wanna make clear. One, when you hear the word prodigal, what do you understand by the word prodigal? Prodigal doesn't mean sinful. Prodigal is an economic term. It is not sinful. It is not a person who is running down women and, and, and uh, being, being, being immoral. The word prodigal means lavish, excessive, extravagant, and unrestrained in your use of resources. That's what the word prodigal means. You are just unrestrained in how you use what you have. You are just unrestrained and lavish and excessive in how you use what you have. And so with that understanding of what prodigal means, here is my first question. Who really is the prodigal in this story? You realize I titled this part of the presentation, not the prodigal son, but the prodigal, the prodigal. Because the more you read this story and you understand what prodigal is, your whole perspective of this story changes and who really is the prodigal? Because this is what you're gonna see. The younger son was excessive in terms of how he used the resources he demanded of his father. Yes, he is a prodigal, but let's what? The first son was excessive and unrestrained with his self-righteousness and religious moralists and the demonstration of a Christianity of negation. This first son, was as much a prodigal of the first uh, as, the, as the second, but the resources that the second one utilized was not the same as the first. The first one was just as excessive because he was unrestrained and was extravagant with his self-righteousness. I've served you all my life and I'm so clean. I'm so morally pure. I am the best Christian ever. I go to church every Sunday morning. You are, not, you are nothing more than another prodigal. You are just excessive with your self-righteousness, excessive with your religious moralist disposition, and excessive with your demonstration of what I call a Christian of Christianity of negation. Negation. What is Christianity of negation? Christianity of negation is a righteousness based on another person's error. I am right because they are wrong. It is not righteousness that is measured by the imputed righteousness of God. This is righteousness Well, we are right because they are wrong. You know, we are right because we never stole anything and because they are stealing. We are right because we have never done what they are doing. That's Christianity of negation. And that's how this son came across. You know, I've done this all this time and this your son, this your son, this your son. Basically, I am so right because he is so wrong. I am so pure because he is so unclean. So who is the prodigal here? So let me back up. The first son, the younger son rather, was excessive with the resources of the father. He took it and he used it in riotous living. But the first son was unrestrained with his self-righteousness, unrestrained with his religious moralists, restrained with this demonstration of a Christianity of negation. But guess what? God, the Father, was excessively lavish with his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his kindness, and his expression of restoration. So you know what? They were all prodigals, if you look at it that way, because all of them, God was on the Father, sorry, was unrestrained. He saw his son at a distance and he dispensed of all paternal protocols and he ran after his son. Now that is the posture of a father that changes my perspective of who I am. I don't care. You could be in this conversation today and maybe Christianity has loaded you with guilt 
and condemnation because maybe you didn't step up to the standards that Christianity would define as appropriate. And so you are constantly looked upon as almost like a pariah of the faith. I want you to deliver yourself from the definitions of Christianity imputed on you by some of your own self-righteous brothers. Self-righteous brothers. You see, the parable of the prodigal puts the father's lavish prodigality. That's a word. It is a word. It puts the father's lavish prodigality of love and grace on display. The true prodigal in this story is the father, the truest prodigal. He was the one who was most excessive in his love, most excessive in his mercy, most excessive in his forgiveness and his redemption. And if only we could have a couple apostolic fathers who could live like that and understand that we'll have less people running around the world whose callings have been left by the wayside, whose ministries have been compromised, and who are living a life of guilt because some apostle trying to make some individual a victim of their definition of what righteousness is. The prodigal, the parable of this prodigal puts the father's lavish prodigality on, of love and grace on display. A love that embraces the younger son with uninhibited joy and goes out to entreat the older. Now, this is important because both of these boys were in need of help. Both of them. Because the self-righteous one looks at the younger one and says that nastiness, that ungodly one. But the truth is, they both need help. The love of this father is to both of them. The love that embraces the younger son with uninhibited joy, total forgiveness, with no record of his mistakes, no record of his foolishness. He stopped his son dead in his tracks while his son is trying to rehearse his own sinfulness. Some apostles say they want you to write a report and they want to keep a dossier of your mistakes on their computer. That's the madness that passes for Christianity. A love that embraces the younger son with uninhibited joy goes out as well to entreat the older self-righteous right, right, the self-righteous son to join the family reunion. And if we continue the story, you'll understand who is the true agent of division within the whole body of Christ. That older self-righteousness, nothing is more ungodly than self-righteousness. That thing is poisonous. You'd realize, well, let me not say that as it. I'm going to, I'm going to take a few minutes more. Note this story. Listen to this, eh? Note the story ends with a cliffhanger. Do you realize this story is incomplete? Go back and read this story. It talks about the prodigals, the, the, the older brother. Jesus, the, the father is having this conversation with the older brother. He said, listen, I, have a, I had a right to throw this party for your brother. He was lost and now he's found. He was dead and he's alive and the story ends there. The story never tells us if that older brother ever joined the family reunion. There's no record of that, whether that older brother joined the family reunion. This is the point. Note that the story ends with a cliffhanger because the older self-righteous moralist for a brother refused to respond to the father's call. That's, the, that's a dangerous place right there. That's a dangerous place. And I'm gonna stop with this note because I wanna get a couple of comments. There's a whole bunch more to this. And this is a quote that I posted on, 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 on my Twitter account years ago. And here what it says. If the prodigals, and that is the context of the first son being referred to as the prodigal, if the prodigal's restored status depended on his self-righteous brother, he would have eaten pig's food until his death. There are way too many fathers who behave like that self-righteous brother. There's way too much of Christianity that postures itself like that self-righteous brother. When we get back together next time, we'll talk maybe some more about that self-righteous brother, but I want this, the objective here is to put the father's posture on display. I am not reading the story of the prodigal son to talk about the self-righteous brother and the sin of the, of the, other, of the, of the younger brother. The, the, the essence of this story is the love of the father. Because your sense of self begins with a revelation of who the Father is. And on that note, I'm going to stop for today and pick up this story 
another time. So let me pause and get some, <clears throat> some feedback, some interaction. So Kelvin, you there? I am. Yeah, man, let's get some feedback. Let's get some, let's get some back and forth. Let me get a couple of people to talk. Yeah. What did you hear? What did you see? Sorry that we cut short, but um, there's a bunch more in this presentation Andy, that we can't talk about. Yeah. Andy, I want to just really just say, I think for the first time in my life, in this story, I saw the father more crystallized. And it really, really touched me because I saw this. This was so powerful that the father saw the son coming, but he ran to him because even every second that his son was away, it pained him. Yeah. And so to run was to cut time short. He could have waited until his son made it all the way to the house. He said, no, let me cut time because yeah. every second you're away from me, there's, there's something missing. There's something that's not right here. And so that was really, really powerful to me that, that I, I have a father who will run to me when I can't make it to him. Right. So thank you. Thank you for this, Andy. You know, the, you know the, the other, there was another thing inside of this story that, 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 that part spoke real strongly to me. And I, I describe it as um, breaking paternal protocols and um, knowledge of how prestigious elite fathers behaved in those days or elite men behaved in those days, they will never run. That is never a part of their behavior. And to see how this father broke that attitude. The second thing that I found was very powerful in this story is the fact that the father never allowed his son to jump through a bunch of, 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 of uh, punitive hoops. Yeah. My father sinned. He said, forget it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it. Forget it. And the other thing is this. Even when the younger son came and was saying to the father, your son did this, your son did that. The father did not entertain the gossip. Didn't say, you're right. It's mm -hmm. true. I didn't see it like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're totally correct. The father cut the other son off. In other words, if you are a father, what are you doing just propagating the foolishness? Mm -hmm. You are there propagating the error and just kind of, yeah, he's a sinner. He's a this, he's a whatever, she's a whatever. And, and you do not possess the heart of the father. Not only did the father did not entertain the son when he returned with a long drawn out story of his misgivings, but the father did not entertain not even the brother from continuing the whole narrative of his son's failing. Mm. That is what a father is. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. And the father even came out of the house to address the older son. He left the party. <laughs> No, he didn't leave. He didn't, he didn't join it. No. <laughs> or the father left the party. That's right. Yeah, the father That's left right. the party to come and rescue his his son to bring his son to to senses. So you see his compassion on both sides of the spectrum. Right. So so thank you, thank you for this, Andy. We'll we'll entertain anyone who'd like to ask a question or make a statement about what Andy set forth here. This is really really something here, you all. So it'd be great to hear from you. What. Just, just raise your hand or just do the emoji or just come on in. Yeah, normally when we have sessions like these, there's always like, a, there's only crickets. There's total silence in the background. I see Lillian, best Lillian, yeah. we haven't seen you in a long time. Lillian, yeah. <laughs> You've been off the Hello. grid or something in Liberia, hey, Lillian. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Liberia, we're in the middle of election chatter. And... Oh, good heavens, good Lord, yeah. Yes, I know. And it's a, it's a difficult playing field because I mean well there are no um there are no easy answers mm -hmm. and maybe there are not even any good answers but we know that um one thing we've learned from this you know under this real we administration is that um no matter what God is doing what he's going to do <laughs> good. and good. you know if, if you're in him you're succeeding and, and it's not going to be easy but it's it's going to be productive and I, you know, that's what I've learned. Um, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how that word Abba is pretty much universal, you know, because it's in Aramaic. It, it's, you know, whether you're saying, you know, mama or papa, you know, there's, it's, 
one way or the other, those words are universal because, and it's not even, you know, the word for father, it is sort of a term of endearment. It is a diminutive mm-hmm. used um, as a substitute for the word father, because even the word father in English or in other, you know, um, in other languages is more formal, but, you know, you would say papa or baba or apa, you know, in whether it's Korean or, you know, you know, some South, some other South Asian language or, um, you know, an African language. And so I, I thought about like the rhetorical efficiency that God has that he will use this one word that he knows that everybody, will, you know, um, everybody will know. Um, because, you know, you scatter, he scatters the languages and he makes people to not understand each other, but there's one word <laughs> or there's a couple of words, um, mother and father that he, that he maintains as um, words that are universally understood. Mm. So that was my first thought that really struck me. Um, I just have really, I don't want to say I'm convicted because I I guess I'm past that point Um, because I've, I've been in that, in the shoes of the, you know, the, the, you know, maybe the older brother, even though I'm the youngest, but I fancied myself the most most spiritually correct and, you know, you know, enlightened and whatnot. Um, and, and so I, you know, early on in my walk, I found myself kind of being the one to say like, y'all need to be doing this and y'all need to be doing that. And, and um, really banging my head against the wall to try and get um, some order in the circles where I exist, whether it's in my family or elsewhere. elsewhere. And it wasn't until I started allowing the Lord to heal me you know, and, and so that I was learning to cast my cares upon him and forget about what everybody else is, you know, struggling with and trying to fix them, but to let him fix me, that whole process was not about me bending, bending my back so that he could beat me over the, you know, the head with a stick. Mm -hmm. Even that process of him fixing me was so much more loving than what I thought I was doing. It was, you know, um, very much a matter of just come and spill your guts because you have a lot of anger. You have a lot of fear. You have a lot of, you know, confusion about things. You know, um, you have a lot of hurt. Spill your guts to me, you know, and he really taught me what it means to cast my cares upon him because he cares. Mm -hmm. Um, And that changed me. And so it wasn't just about, you know, my, 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 the change in me and the way I relate to my family, relate to other people, wasn't just about him telling me to shut up and look at yourself and look at the, the log in your eye before you start taking out the specs in other people's eye. Because, you know, when we, when we think about that scripture, it is a rebuke. Right. Mm. But he wasn't just telling me, shut up and look at yourself. He was saying, come and talk to me about you because I care about you. And so, you know, as we got preoccupied with all of that, so much more understanding about the dynamics that cause people to um, walk in, quote unquote, unrighteousness really, you know, became much more clear. And Mm. then. Um, that understanding brought love. It brought compassion. It brought patience. You know, um, so it, it, that's just been my experience. And it's, I, it, it, it's, it's just kind of the gentle, um, well, the world, you know, there, there's a term out there called well, gentle parenting, which is something else. But, but that gentle parenting that he did for me was it wasn't, you know, the change did not come from, from being browbeaten because, you know, as an African child, like I know what browbeating is and it's, you know, the trauma that comes from that and it does not work. It does not, right. you know, it, it may go some way towards um, establishing standards of behavior, but it doesn't, you know, it, it teaches us to perform correctness, right? But then there's a whole lot of mess inside. It's spaghetti on the wall on the inside. 
Yeah, right, right. Um, so and and mm -hmm. and what 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 God is and what Abba Father and you know when you look on YouTube and a lot of these YouTube um, you know preachers or prophets, you know people are getting more into calling God by His actual name, which is Yahweh, or Yah, you know, and and even that brought me closer to Him. So that it's not just this formal title like doctor, because God is like the you know He is a deity. And so that is the, you know, that is the, the, the formal title for a deity, for the mm. deity, um, but calling him by his name and recognizing him as a person brought me closer to him. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah, this is excellent. really well, it's, amazing. Thank uh, you. Excellent. Kevin, it's three o'clock. Should we have, if there's some more interaction that we need, I, I'm going to leave, leave the board in your court. Okay, okay, then. All right. We have uh, uh, Henry, Kamal, Henry, and uh, Brenda wanted to say something. And then we can, uh, we can real quick, uh, Brenda, go ahead. Yeah, and then I, Henry. Yeah, thank you so much for that teaching, Andy. Uh, you know, I just see the prodigal father operating in the same spirit as as Abba Father, and I and I think about how, you know, when when Paul talks about for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through mm. the death of His Son, how much more? So right. so I just see that pattern that the uh, prodigal's father operating in the same as our heavenly father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Thank you, thank you, Kelvin. Thank you very much, Adi, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. That uh, reminding us that God's way is actually redemptive and restorative. That is the purposes. And mm. in that, this story, this prodigal story, the father is reaching out to the son to redeem him and to restore him to his purposes. One of the things why the father was actually restoring the, the son is because of his, the purposes. The father knew that this son had purposes to fulfill. Mm. And he knew that the detours these detours that the son had would not uh, determine or define who he was. These were just detours. And therefore, he reached out to him. When he came back to the father, the father embraced him and back to his purposes. And this is the same thing that Christ was teaching here, dealing with that oppressive spirit of Phariseeism that was there. And he's reminding us that the, we should be away, very much away. We should not entertain that spirit of Phariseeism, that spirit that is oppressive. We need our, the ways he has shown us is also to be able to embrace others and help them in that restoration process because it's about the purposes of God. And this is the same story where he's told the, 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 the prostitute he had forgiven him and back to the purposes. Mm. So this is a way he is showing us how we are supposed to function mm. to be back into his purposes. Redemption and restoration is the key thing. So thanks very much for mailing us yeah. that. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Kamal. Always good having you on, brother. Thank you. All right. That's going to be it for this week, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we'll get the recording out to you as soon as it becomes available. So until next week, uh, we bid you farewell. Kelvin, can we get those notes? Anderson's notes were promised last week. That's up. That's up to Andy. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get Thank it. You. I'll get it to you. I, I will. I will get it to you. you, you Thank you. you. Okay. okay. Man. Cool. Thank okay, you. Have a good night. Good night. Good day. Bye. -bye.